this morning I'm going to be speaking to you about real-time virus quantification, uh, accelerating the pace of uh, research and development and production using what we call the Virus Counter 3100. So I've been the Chief Technology Officer for this company for nine months now, and so I haven't hit a lot of these venues yet. I thought I'd give you just a, a brief introduction to myself, give you a sense of what my background is. For the last decade, leading up until June of last year, I actually led the flow cytometry division of what became Thermo Fisher recently, but previously it was Life Technologies in Vitrogen and Molecular Probes. After a decade there, I asked myself the question, what do I want to do for the next 20 years of my life? And uh, decided I wanted to try a startup, or a startup. Uh, I was familiar with Virusite that had presented to us at Molecular Probes in 2012, and just was enamored with what they had done in terms of taking a very complicated uh, technology, that being flow cytometry, and reducing it to a very particular uh, analysis and platform, that is virus quantification. Um, as you'll see, it's not an easy thing to do, um, but they seem to have managed uh, to get themselves in a really good position there, and very exciting given what's going on in the world right now with all of the viral uh, outbreaks around the world. So I was just in to totally enamored by the technology, I called them uh, last February and asked if they had any open positions, and uh, fortunately they were looking for a technology lead, so I grabbed the position and started there in June of last year. So let's get into the presentation. Um, virus quantification, these are not viruses, but they are nanoparticles. Um, I wanted to put in perspective how difficult it is to detect particles of this size. Um, to put it in perspective, that's probably about 50 nanometer particles. So if you extrapolate that across the screen, uh, then the entire width of that screen would be a minor fraction of the width of a human hair. So incredibly difficult to detect, as you probably all know. And for many years, as we'll get into, um, often biological readouts were used to detect viruses. The other thing that makes them very particularly difficult to recognize in a flow cytometer um, is their small size. Typically, flow cytometers will use a scatter parameter, where you're looking at the interaction of the light with a particle. And so the particle actually scatters the light due to internal reflections, etc. It's not unlike how a rainbow is formed inside of a water droplet, right? The light goes in, it bounces around, and it shoots out in different wavelengths. Almost impossible to do with the virus because they're so small. Your wavelength of light has to be around the same range as the diameter of the particle that you're looking at. And since the lowest wavelength light that most cytometers are equipped with would be UV at about 350 nanometers, and since viruses max out at around 300 nanometers, it makes it exceptionally difficult to look at them by traditional flow cytometry. And so Virusite has done some very special things to allow for that detection. Before I go there, though, um, the question is, uh, the, the, the larger overriding philosophical question is, why do total particle counts matter? Uh, I think it can be summed up nicely here. If you look at, um, from, uh, from virology, an analysis of the particle to plaque forming unit ratio. So this gives you a sense, I guess, in the end of how um, efficient some of these viruses are in terms of packaging themselves effectively so that you get intact uh, uh, infectious virions. And you can see that the range is quite dramatic, anywhere from alpha virus that's around one to two, um, all the way down to papillomavirus here, about 10,000 particles per platforming unit. There's a growing body, body of evidence that suggests that non-infected particles are biologically active. Being a molecular immunologist myself, um, that really speaks to me, given most of the morbidity and mortality that we see with viruses, or a large amount, is due to the extreme immune responses that we're seeing to these organisms. There's also the emergence of what are called non-infective vaccine modalities with virus-like particles. And so there, you're not going to be able to use a plaque-forming unit assay because there's nothing there bi biologically active to go after the cells that you'd be looking at. They're both essential, that being the titers and particle numbers for accurate uh, viral characterization for some of the reasons that I just pointed out. And then previously, this had not been possible uh, due to the nature of the particles and some of the things that I alluded to in that first slide about how small they are, how they scatter very little light, and how difficult they are to detect even with the most sensitive techniques you know, in a rapid way, and that being uh, flow cytometry or standard flow cytometry. 
traditional methods, just kind of a brief overview, and then I'll dig into a little bit more granularity on the different techniques in the next few slides. Um, traditionally, they are very time consuming, plaque tighter, can take days to weeks. And being a student of flow cytometry, I look at this and I say to myself, well, this is using counting statistics just like a flow cytometer does, and just like you would in a hemocytometer. And in Poisson counting statistics, your standard error is the square root of the number divided by the number. So if you have a very low number of particles that you're counting, then your error is going to be extremely large. And so there are many, many different areas where you can get uh, enhanced error with this kind of assay. Not to mention that it's a biological assay that has a lot of distinct from different variables. Um, they make, that, that makes them very expensive and technical. Um, often we talk to people who kind of don't appreciate fully uh, technician time. Uh, they tend to look at just the cost of materials, uh, but it's extremely expensive. And of course, that can cause delays, and delays, especially in larger companies that are making vaccines, means money. But they're actively creating their vaccines and their seasonal, um, seasonal approach uh, is costing them quite a bit of money on a day-to-day -day basis. So as I mentioned, I'll dig in a little bit more on some of the traditional ways of looking at uh, virus particle counting. I'm not going into a lot of the analysis of hemoglobin or uh, the, uh, the neuraminidase or surface proteins on these, um, but just focusing mainly in the uh, virus particle counting area. Black assay, as I mentioned, um, days or weeks, the labor is high, cost per sample is medium. The pros are it is a functional assay. It's cell specific and it does give you uh, a direct and observable readout. We talked about some of the cons, long time cost. Um, uh, electron microscopy, obviously also very expensive. You need a, an electron microscope to actually perform these kinds of assays. It does give you a direct morphological observation. You can see uh, any aggregates that are present, but you do not get um, a good biological readout in the sense that you don't know which of the particles may be empty and which ones may be full. Remember that table that I showed you, that can vary dramatically. Fluorescence focus, um, that is also similar to plaque assay. It's a little bit faster there. You're using antibodies with fluorochromes to detect the expression of viral proteins before the cells actually lyse, but still subject to some of the same cons as the plaque assay. And then of course, um, TCID50 and EID50 functional assays, but again, you've got a very similar long time to answer using a cell culture uh, type of approach. So in terms of the emerging uh, virus particle counting methods, there are a couple that rely upon um, multi-angle light scattering. Um, I did tell you that viruses are difficult to see using scatter. Uh, that is very true. Um, if you, however, use different angles and collect more light coming around the virus, then you can see some of the light that does interact, um, albeit small. There's also another approach that uses Brownian motion, you know, very similar to that first slide that I showed you with all the particles moving. It takes advantage of the fact that in random Brownian motion, smaller particles move more quickly than larger particles. And so it's actual, actually able to trace the, uh, the change in speed or the difference in speed uh, and then correlate that to particle size. And then, of course, the virus counter, uh, which is my main reason for being here today. The precision is very high. Time, you literally uh, collect your sample in one minute. There's a 30-minute incubation period with the fluorochromes and the reagents. But you're collecting one minute worth of data. There's time on either side, because the instrument was designed to actually clean itself in between, do another test of accuracy using small microbeads, and then you run the next sample. The other thing that I would argue is that the virus counter is giving you, some, uh, giving you data that um, is more what I call biologically relevant. And what I mean by that, rather than looking at just a particle count where you don't know what the particle is, we're actually using two different fluorophores, uh, one that recognizes nucleic acid and the other that recognizes protein. So you actually have a biological correlation to the particles that you're seeing. And of course those fluorochromes get around the lack of scatter of the viruses by giving you um, fluorogenic or fluorescent signal. So what I'll do is I'll dig into the virus counter in some detail. For those of you who may be familiar with the virus counter, I'm going to get into probably much more detail than you've seen so far. This is a workshop, so I always figured we should have something tangible to do 
I brought some props. It looks like they're all probably too far away and not close enough together. Um, but uh, you're welcome to take a look at this, and I'll, I'll speak to what these are as we go through. So it's a novel approach, uh, a directed approach to look at, sorry, to look at total virus particle counts. It's the first and only automated technology specifically developed to quantify virus particles. Uh, what you see here um, is the auto sampler that allows for 96 well uh, analysis. The virus counter sits on top of it. And I think this may be the first trade show that we brought the full system to. So we have um, at least the, uh, the skin of the virus counter, and we do have a platform and 96 volt plate loader at our booth. So please come by and take a look at it. You get re results in what I mentioned, minutes, not weeks or days. Uh, I, I've already alluded to the fact that you can use it as a standalone, putting one vial on at a time, or using a 96 volt plate that lets you set up your experiments, go home, come back the next day, read and analyze your data, and then set up another experiment. So it makes things very efficient. And <clears throat> it's got a rugged industrial design, and it, the software has been set up to be 21 CFR Part 11 capable in terms of data storage, traceability, etc. And those are all, um, you're not charged for them up front. If you need that capability, then you can pay and have those things added. So how does it work? Uh, I've mentioned uh, that the fluorogenic dyes, and I want to stress that word fluorogenic rather than fluorescent because it's very important, and I'll, I'll tell you why in the next slide. It's a 30-minute staining protocol. Uh, I've already mentioned that the instrument itself is small, self-contained. It's about this big, and again, please come by and you take a look at uh, our booth. The software, um, powerful yet intuitive, I would definitely agree with that. When we built the world's first acoustic focusing cytometer at LifeTech, uh, one of the things, one of the expressions that came out of the development was that it's always about the software. Um, the software is always difficult in flow cytometry, difficult to interpret. And I gotta say, this is one of the most uh, easy to use, most intuitive softwares that I've ever used in cytometer. And of course, the assay is very simple, and cost per sample uh, is dramatically lower than you'd see in other, uh, other approaches. So for me now, this is the fun part, having been at molecular probes for a decade. Uh, we do not, as a company, and I apologize, uh, speak to exactly what the structures of our compounds are. Uh, this is a DNA dye, not specifically the DNA dye that we use, but uh, I put that up there to make the point about how it works. By fluorogenic, we mean that the molecule, as it stands, free in solution, may be colorimetric, but it may not be fluor uh, fluorescent. And often that's because you have sway or wobble between some of the fluorescent parts of the molecule. And what happens was, in interacting with its cognate ligand, and in this case, DNA, you can see the, the, the helix down here, you end up with portions of the molecule sticking into the DNA molecule. And when you impart that rigidity, then the fluorescence increases. It can increase anywhere from 100-fold up to maybe even 2,000-fold, depending upon the fluorochrome. Now, the beauty of that is, since you can't readily wash viruses like you can cells with what I call a um, a blood bank uh, centrifuge, you have to leave your reagent in solution. And that can cause problems, because that means that you have reagent, potentially, whose background could swamp the specific signal that you're seeing. But by using a fluorogenic molecule, you can avoid that, because anything that's free-floating in solution is a hundredfold at least less, fluores less fluorescent than the dye that's floating around free in solution. The same can be said for our protein stain. Again, similar to this, this isn't the exact dye, but with the bend that you can get around this bond right here, this makes this colorimetric, um, but it is not highly fluorescent until it binds uh, inside of a protein. So those are the two dyes that are used in our system. Now the part that I would have passed around, and please um, stay afterwards, and you can take a look at the, this is an antiquated flow cell from our instrument, but it still makes the point. The principle of flow cytometry that allows for particles to be analyzed, even though they're quite small, is called hydrodynamic focusing. And you can see that here in this cartoon that I put together. Effectively, what you have here, kind of a cartoon, is your sample coming up through this tube here, a sheath fluid coming in here. That sheath fluid is moving much more rapidly than the sample itself. So you've got sheath going very quickly. 
the sample comes in, they may be very close together, but by the time they get here, they get accelerated out of that needle. And so that acceleration separates them, and then it also forces them through the very center of the laser. So laser power is typically um, Gaussian in distribution. There are newer lasers that have flat tops on them, but this laser is Gaussian, and so you want to make sure that your virus particle goes through the very center so you get maximum stimulation. And that way, those fluorogenic molecules that I talked about that may not be the brightest in the world, they get maximally stimulated, and you see a signal. You can kind of see this here in the newer generation of the flow cell, this angled part here and here, really kind of this here, and then you can see the small needle um, for the sample introduction. Now, in contrast to conventional flow cytometry, actually the, what we call the core size here, and that's the width of the sample core once it gets accelerated and becomes stabilized. Traditional cytometers, that core is anywhere from 10 to 25 microns in diameter. So if you can imagine, this is nine in our instrument. So a core in a traditional cytometer would basically span this entire laser spot and so when you go through parts of the laser that are not as intense, your signal drops. That can not only increase your CV, but could also lead to missing a particle as it passes through. We also make the full kits for the product. This is one of the other things that I really appreciated about this counter. It doesn't leave anything to guesswork. You have the vials, um, all of the different reagents that are included. The caps are all color-coded. It's very clearly labeled what they are. Again, if you were all closer together, I could, I could pass this out and uh, you could take a look at it, but please come up afterwards uh, and take a look. So everything is there. All of the individual vials for the 200 tests that you will need, uh, the fluids, uh, the uh, performance beads that I talked about, all of the other solutions that are there and necessary to run the instrument. So there's nothing you need to think about. There's nothing ancillary that's out there that you need to pick up. Uh, everything's included. This is the standalone kit for individual samples. And then, of course, the same for the 96 volt format as well. So, inside the instrument, then, the flow cell that I just showed you, the little cartoon with the sheet fluid running and the viruses, this is the top of it. So, we're looking down at the instrument right now. So, imagine the sheet fluid and sample are coming down underneath, they're coming out on top here, and then that flows into the waste. So now you need to identify or, or get that laser into that, what we call interrogation point. So up here is a diagram of what's shown here, maybe difficult to see. The laser is right here, as it is here. It produces green, a green light, 532 nanometers. If this was necessary for the two floor probes that were chosen for the, for the instrument. There's actually a, a very innovative piece right here um, which is extremely simplified here. You can see it down here. This is a mirror that reflects the laser through a shaping optic and then into the side of the flow cell, into the quartz cubat. This is unique because if the instrument goes out of alignment, you can actually set it up to auto-align by itself. It'll go find a position that's optimal for the laser. And that's critically important because I mentioned to you, we've got single micron clearances in a lot of these metrics and uh, measurements that we have inside the instrument. Of course, the fluorochromes have different wavelengths of emission. One of them is orange, and the other is kind of a bright red color. So both wavelengths of light come out. They go through a spatial filter. They hit a dichroic mirror, uh, which is a long pass mirror. So it lets the longer wavelength of light go into this detector, the protein photomultiplier, and it pushes the nucleic acid signal into that DMT. And that way you're able to separate the two wavelengths of light coming off of the virus. What that allows you to do, in my crude example or drawing of a virus as being an icosahedron here, um, this would be an empty virus particle. This would be nucleic acid maybe that did not get incorporated or effectively placed into uh, a virion. So you have three basic scenarios. You've got nucleic acid that's naked, you've got the capsid with protein and an envelope on it that has nothing inside. It goes back to that correlation between particle per plaque forming unit. This can happen quite frequently. And then the ideal situation is where you have nucleic acid and protein present. Both fluorochromes are binding. 
as the viruses and the particles pass through. If you have nucleic acid alone, you get one signal. If you have protein alone, you get a different signal. I hope you can see this is a red peak, this is a blue peak. And then, of course, if you have both present at the same time, you get a simultaneous event. You can see that. Maybe a little bit difficult here, but there's blue and red in all three of these peaks here. The other unique thing that the instrument does in terms of precision, these dotted lines that you see across here um, are the thresholds. And that shows you where these signals need to jump, um, basically, to give you a positive result or a count. That is actually dynamically handled. So in that one minute, and I'll get into this a little bit more, there's 15 million, um, I'm sorry, 45 million pieces of data that are collected. Right? At 250 kilohertz, it's sampling every four microseconds. So over a minute, that's 15 million individual queries to the PMTs to ask what the voltage is coming off of that PMT. So that's a lot of data. Um, but it also means that you need to be cognizant of any low frequency changes in the instrument, just normal variations. And so there's an algorithm that on the fly actually calculates in very small discrete pieces the baseline and the threshold at that time to make sure that it, uh, it corrects for any variation in the instrument. So what does the virus counter actually measure? Uh, I just mentioned to you, it, it, it goes out and it asks the PMT, what is the voltage at four microseconds? What is it at eight microseconds? And it does that 15 million times over a minute. And then simply put, it plots the voltages over time. And it's hard to see there, but I've got both blue and red just stylistically put up there for an example. They're plotted, and if you will, take that little piece of data here, and you could argue that it represents a very small section or a very small time there. And then those are plotted over time, and you get these very nice peaks that give you the data that I just showed you. The other thing I like about this is that it's what I call, it's the purest form of flow cytometry data. Because a conventional cytometer, you get dots, or dot plots. And everybody looks at them and goes, oh, those are cells, and they're positive for this or positive for that. Well, the reality is those are voltages that are plotted um, as a dot, like one voltage versus another voltage. Our instrument creates voltage peaks. So it is the most basic of flow cytometry data, and it's very powerful. It allows you to analyze so if you go down here, this is the whole one minute pulse. Um, the peaks are just too small to see, but this little box indicates that this has been expanded to this box here. And then this box has been expanded to this box here. There are too many data points for the instrument to store all 45 million events or 45 million pieces of data for each run. So the instrument stores the last six seconds of the actual plot and then it calculates the statistics on all of the other data that it collected. One of the things that you can see here very nicely is dual peaks. On uh, some instances here, we just had a protein peak, so that would not have been counted as a simultaneous event, so it would not count as a virus. Over here, what we have is something called coincidence. That's where two virus particles are very close together. So as it went through the laser, the voltage went up. And before it can come all the way back down the baseline again, the other virus was so close to it, it went back up again. And so you can actually plot and look at the widths of the peaks that you have, and you can very easily determine when your concentration is too high. Your counts will start to plateau because you're beginning to count coincident peaks as one peak rather than two peaks. So for me, it was very powerful, very intuitive, uh, and very obvious. We also have a kit designed to help clean up the system. Those dyes that I talked about um, work best, like anything else, for very purified samples. Yeah, this particular uh, method for cleaning uh, a sample up was originally created for um, egg-grown influenza. We've actually taken it in the, the larger form. I think we do um, express in our literature that this was a a product that was designed by General Electric, GE Healthcare. We actually put it into a smaller format, 96 well and also single tube use. And that allows you here, you can see all of this background, probably endosomes. These are the standard beads as reference. It allows you to clean that up if some of these smaller things empty the pores, and then you're left with the clean virus. So people have been using that um, in addition to influenza 
on other viruses as well, dengue, um, uh, Marx, norovirus, etc. So, if we then come back full circle and talk about um, the a, a comparison of the different kinds of virus particle uh, counting or, or virus quantification, here we've got different viruses, three different me uh, methods of counting the virus counter, uh, electron microscopy, um, and also TCID50. Uh, it's reminiscent or brings me back again to this story here of how inefficient sometimes the packaging of viruses can be. And so that's clearly reflected in the data. In this particular case, looking at electron microscopy um, and virus counter versus TCID50. You get some dramatic differences in those counts. Now, both may be important. You may want to know what the infectious dose is, etc. But it's always nice to have that particle count, especially if you're going to do anything functional um, or certainly with uh, a vaccine in mind in the end. So, there are other areas of impact. Um, I realized I better move very quickly now. Uh, I'll, I'll talk just briefly about vaccine production, protein expression, and viral therapeutics in terms of um, the impact of knowing both your plaque forming units, uh, that biological readout, as well as uh, actual virus particle counts. In vaccine development, of course, you're probably all very familiar with this. There's a, um, a cycle in terms of development of vaccines. And there are discrete areas along the way where virus counting, um, exact particle counts, are extremely important. If you look at virus growth, the first part of the process, and then there's viral purification and manufacturing, this points out, using two different media, medium A and medium B, how important it may be on a very discrete, um, contemporaneous timeline to be looking at what's going on in your samples. In this case, uh, harvesting at the wrong time could really have a tremendous impact on the yield of your virus. Um, you can also look at effects of pH, time, uh, other nutrients inside of the medium, etc. Here in the purification step, uh, what's not shown here is the basic the, the volume of, what's, uh, of what remains after each of these steps. Um, the take home message though is that in each of these different processes in a purification step, you're going to be losing virus. And it would be uh, extremely helpful to know where you're losing the most so you can optimize those conditions. All of this work was done using a virus count. And then, of course, in the manufacturing part of this, you need to ensure consistency, lot to lot, track manufacturing from start to finish. And this just, once again, points out uh, the different results that you can get with the three different formats. Bacula virus, I think those presentations happened here this morning, so I won't go into a lot of detail around the background, how it's used. Uh, but this is incredibly important as well, these two different constructs, constructs A and B. Um, again, a, a dramatic reminder of uh, what a difference it could make uh, when you actually harvest these and how you assess the effectiveness uh, of different constructs that you might be using. And then finally here for baculovirus, monitoring infection. Here looking at TCID50, which again is kind of like a plaque titer assay. You're looking at uh, cell death. Uh, and correlating those with the log virus counter result, you can see that it does correlate extremely well, which you'd expect it to. But you can use the B, uh, Y equals MX plus B part of that, uh, kind of the intercept, uh, or as a way, uh, a log transformation to look at the difference between the actual counts. And 1.99 is almost 2. It indicates that it's actually a hundredfold. The virus counter is counting a hundredfold more particles than you get from TCID50. Again, pointing out the dramatic difference that you can have an actual particle number and a flat titer or biological data. I'm going to jump over this simply because uh, time. I want to give people uh, time for questions. And I'll, I'll, I also won't spend a lot of time here. But as you know, in viral therapy, you may be looking to induce a virus that will force the um, production or expression of a protein or a subunit, something that's important, that's lacking in a disease state. Uh, or you may be uh, inducing an oncolytic virus that actually targets cancer cells and forces them to lice. So clearly, I think with the other examples that I've given to you, you can understand that throughout these processes, it's incredibly important to track the actual virus number that you have in addition to uh, its infectivity. This one as well really struck home for me. 
uh, if you're looking at virus amount, in this case HeLa cells infected with measles, and you're trying to determine what it might be best depending upon what you're doing to harvest, um, you might just look at this plot and say, well, you know, the more the barrier, um, but if you start to look at TCID50 and you see this starting to tail off, um, it makes you realize that, well, sure, the count is increasing ever so slightly, but I maybe should have stopped way back here because what kind of proteases or nucleases are the cells creating where they're basically becoming toxic uh, inside of the solution? So uh, for me, an uh, extremely important uh, indicator of cell health. So from a versatility perspective for the instrument, this is a short list of some of the viruses that have been quantitated with uh, the virus counter. I don't know if you've all seen it. Uh, we do have uh, copies of a paper that was just published uh, in an open journal, Viruses, looking at the evaluation of Ebola uh, by U.S. Amrin. We do have copies of that at our booth, um, so you're welcome to come by and grab them. But this is just a short list Oops. of the viruses that we've looked at. And while I can't speak to it because of uh, intellectual property issues, we are enhancing our uh, detection reagents. Um, and plan to be introducing many more different ways to look at viruses to hopefully expand the numbers of different kinds of viruses that we can see. And so to kind of wrap up, uh, this is where we have placements currently. Uh, I, I think this is, a, this is a short one, a partial list. Anything that has a blue box in it is where we have more than one instrument placed. And our idea is really to, to help the scientific community and in a perfect world, make the virus counter kind of the standard for, for whole particle detection. For me, the most important part of that is the biological relevance that comes from the use of two fluorogenic molecules that recognize nucleic acid and protein. We also, as I mentioned, um, do have a auto sampler, and we'll go into a lot of detail there. Um, you can come by the booth and see it. Again, this allows for 96 volt plate running, and we, we do have one. At, we're placing them now, but we have one at the office, and um, my associate scientist who uses it just loves the fact that he can set up an experiment, put it on the instrument, come in in the morning. It's a really nice workflow. He can look at his data, interpret it, set up the next experiment, get it all running, start it, and go home. And he's basically working while he's home because he's running the samples overnight. So I'll end with that. Again, thank you for the opportunity and everybody for coming. I'm happy to take questions. It looks like we've got about seven minutes left. So thank you very much.